But let's introduce him now. Jason, how are you doing today, sir? Good. How are you guys doing? Not bad. Not bad. You're in, uh, what time is it there? Around 9.30-ish? Yeah. Yep, 9.30. All right. Well, we won't keep you too long then. Uh, so, Jason, I guess, tell us a little bit about yourself. So, like I said, you, you were with Gottfrag, uh, lead software developer there. Is that correct? Uh, so I, I joined them in the early 2000s. Um, I actually came to them with a uh, statistics system for Counter-Strike stats. Um, and I, I kind of independently developed a, developed a system. And I was looking for a way to get it out there. You know, Godfrag was the place to go for, uh, you know, any esports related news. Uh, I came to them and uh, we talked it out and uh, I hopped on board. Uh, you know, we ended up calling it GameSense. Uh, you know, a lot of people might be familiar with that. Um, so I was a lead developer on that uh, throughout its existence. And uh, so I, I coded that and then I worked with uh, Jason Kuhn, who is the main developer of Gottfrag. And you know, we worked on getting stats out there publicly for, for everybody. I want to talk about GameSense since you brought it up there. Because uh, reading yep. through your, your profile on your website and everything, that's the one thing that catches our eye there where... So it's a, it's, it's a statistical match tournament tracking system that... Got frag used for any type of Counter Strike and everything. There was it only Counter Strike? Uh, no, I mean we we started to expand to different games. Uh, you know, we started with Counter Strike. Uh, it was a pretty simple transition to Counter Strike Source. Um, we also did it for Day of Defeat. You know, everything is built on the Half Life engine, so you know, collecting the stats and everything was kind of a similar process. And we started looking at other avenues like Warcraft 3 or Halo, um, but we you know, never ended up publishing anything in regards to that. But Counter-Strike, Counter-Strike Source, and Day of Defeat were the, the main ones that we operated with. So if you could um, kind of compare it, I, I know I've heard that nothing's really come to comparison to, to GameSense as of yet, but if you can kind of compare it to something out there now, I don't, I don't know if you've kept up with the statistical software that they've got going. Uh, is there any comparison in, into GameSense and nowadays? You know, I, I mean, I've, I've seen HLTV.org, uh, you know, put out some stats and a lot of things are, you know, either very similar or taken from the type of stats that we were doing. But, you know, it's, uh, you know, we released in... Uh, 2004, uh, I think 2004, uh, winter CPL and, you know, it's been well over 10 years and, and I, I still don't think that anything is, um, I don't think anything's really matched it, uh, from what I've seen. Uh, and you know, I, I think there's a few reasons for that. Uh, some of them just related to, you know, I, I think we had a really good team working on it and, uh, I, I think there's other situations like with CSGO and the availability of, uh, you know, getting the data just to generate those type of statistics seems a lot more challenging now. Um, so it's interesting so, then that you, yeah. that you brought up HLTV because actually before the show, that was the one thing that I, we were kind of discussing this game sense and everything here. And that's the one website that I could think of that kind of only does any kind of stat keeping out there and even then it's a little sloppy in my opinion there's some stats where you just don't even know what they mean right now, in in your point of view why why do you think that is so i know you just said it takes a lot of work and the teamwork and everything but in esports as a whole why do you think stat keeping in general isn't like a primary thing because my fear here jason and maybe game sense can save this so maybe you need to bring it back <laughs> <laughs> but I fear that when esports actually takes that turn into the the norm into mainstream and we have our hall of fame there is no way to go back and see who has most kills or any type of those records that you would typically see in a record book because there's just the lack of stats keeping out there sure um well you know I, I I've been kind of out of the esports game for a while but um yeah, I I kind of looked at it from a side, you know, in regards to like CSGO and the availability of, of generating stats. And uh, actually one of the things 
uh, touches on, you know, one of the earlier podcasts that you guys had where you were talking about our, you know, what's more important, what's more important, uh, developers or the gamers. And I think you guys, you know, you guys talked about a lot of good angles, but there was, there was one that was kind of missing. Um, and from the perspective of developer support for, uh, for getting that sort of information. So for example, uh, you know, take, take a game like Starcraft or, or Heroes of the Storm, you know, uh, like Blizzard, they might release a file format where, um, you can retrieve some information from, from the match, but you can't actually go through and, and collect that data. Um, you know, uh, CSGO, I'm, I'm not actually sure what's in place. I imagine there is some sort of uh, server logs or, or something that can be retrieved. Um, but I think one of the challenges is getting support from developers. So I know you guys were talking about, like, you know, when developers change the game around and is it better for spectators? Uh, but I think a lot of what can push esports forward or make it go forward are the availability of, of tools for people. So something like, you know, Twitch came about on its own and it's something that, you know, made it easy for everybody to watch other players. Um, you know, right now there really isn't a lot of developer support from, from anybody to give other people tools to produce that information. So, you know, there's no, like APIs or a way to get information. Um, so do you think it's, it's the developers? That way. Do you think it's the developers well, kind of notice it being in their benefit to kind of keep that stuff on lock? I mean, I'm, I understand like the more access you allow to, to the data in the game, the easier it is to, you know, in the future, either uh, cheat or, you know, mine it for different things, you know, nefarious reasons. So is it, do they see it as kind of like, you know, their baby, they don't want anyone getting in there and messing with it. And that's kind of why they keep it, keep it under closed doors. Uh, you know, well, I'm not even, I wouldn't even say it's that, uh, I mean, any, anything in regards to this takes, um, you know, takes a lot of developer time. Uh, you know, there has to be a plan in place. Like if, if we provide these tools for people, you know, what, you know, how does that benefit us? You know, so if, if they're providing, APIs or logs or, or different things, you know, they, they might want to develop those things themselves. They might want to develop a stat system themselves or run a league themselves, you know, and just, you know, being a developer myself and having worked for, you know, several large companies or corporations, it, it could just be as simple as, you know, we don't, uh, you know, until esports gets bigger, we may not have a need for that yet. Or in a case of like Blizzard where, you know, even you look at Overwatch, where they kind of removed a lot of the scoreboard information from the matches. It it could be uh, a, the philosophy. Like I, I interviewed there at, at Blizzard uh, over the summer, and you know the philosophy has always been, uh, you know, like the quality of the game first over data, things like that. So I I, I don't think it's from from the perspective you said, I think it might just be more of lack of um, lack of a need that these developers or companies see to provide that, or they may want to provide it themselves, or lack of resources. It's I'm not really sure, but um, it can be frustrating for somebody such as myself or somebody out there like HLTV that would you know want to provide things for people. So it's almost because the lack of demand, they're not supplying the supply. And really, because before recent history, there has never been the need for it because before esports, there was no one looking back. I mean, unless it was just bragging, right? So you never needed stats. Well, so we kind of, it goes even further uh, in, into more traditional sports too. Um, Lurpus released an article today where he was answering mailbag questions and one of them happened to deal with statistics. In Counter Strike, and, and his or his uh, point of view on it is that statistics don't really tell you anything unless y it can only be used to confirm what you already think by just watching the game. So it could be that right. too, or people just don't even really want stats because it might disagree with what they see while they're watching the game. 
Right. Uh, that's a good point. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wholeheartedly disagree with that statement that they can't really, they don't really tell you anything other, other than confirming what you see. I mean, you look at, you know, look at baseball, Moneyball, all that, uh, you know, all these advanced statistics coming out like sports VU and, uh, and the NBA, there's, there's so much information and, you know, granted, sometimes it's just data that you can't draw conclusions from, but, um, there's, you know, there's a lot of information you can, you can collect, uh, you know, for example, with, with game sense, we, uh, we did, uh, we did, an, or I did an article on, I was calculating and I wanted to see, you know, like if you get the first kill in the round, how important is that compared to how often you would win the round? And, and, you know, it didn't matter what map, it didn't matter, uh, situation, what tournament it was, you know, we found a rule that if you got the first kill in the round you the team won that 75% of the time and if the, if you got the first two in a round the team would win 90% of the time and you know you, all the way up to the first uh the first three in a round that the team would win 98% of the time and uh, you know that that doesn't mean you might change your strategy to just try to get the first kill no matter what but you know it's it's relevant information and we did stats on you know map balance uh whether or not the c t or the t side was you know extremely imbalanced um you know we were collecting information on you know uh, this tournament used a three minute round time and this one used two and a half and you could compare the stats and see you know is it more balanced to use one or the other so there's a lot of information aside from just um you know, who's performing best in that match that you can look at. And then even from that perspective, you know, we, I can't remember if it, I still can't remember if it was me or uh, Trevor Schmidt, we invented the assist stat that you see, you know, in a lot of FPSs and other games now where, you know, you might be doing most of the damage to people and not, not actually getting credit for the frags, but you might actually be performing really well in that match. So there's, I, I really disagree with that statement that, you know, the looking at statistics, just confirming what you've already seen with the match. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm a, I'm a big advanced statistics guy for hockey, and I'm constantly throwing numbers out there because I think it tells you more than what you can see with your own eyes. Um, but just sure. to just to wrap up uh, the game since talk, if there could be what was what was the most interesting statistic that you guys collected and saw? What was what was one of the just the craziest things you would have never thought you would see until you looked at the data? Uh, I I think it was, we uh, we used we we looked at every round that we had ever recorded, and um, we figured out the number of rounds that somebody won where. Um, say that all four of their, all four of somebody's, all four of your teammates were killed and it was a one V five. And um, I can't remember the exact number, but I think the number of times somebody won a one V five was seven out of like 10,000 or something ridiculous like that. And, you know, that it's not totally surprising a statistic, but it's just cool to, you know, kind of figure that out. When, when you see the, the actual numbers to it. Yeah, totally agree. So, so there's that. Now, I did see real quick, I don't want to get too far because I don't want to keep you too long, and I want to bring up the MLG and all the Gottfrag and now how Activision purchased them. But real quick, because we're still, I was looking at your website, did did you work on Punkbuster as well? Yeah, uh, that's actually kind of how I got started with, uh, you know, just gaming. You know, I was an avid Counter-Strike player, and I played since, you know, Beta 6. And um, they had... uh, you know, they detected the cheats the normal way, but they had another feature that would take screenshots of players during the game. Um, and they had it for Windows. They needed a version for, uh, you know, Unix-based systems. So, you know, the guy who ran it put a call out, and, you know, I told him, hey, I'd write, I'd write, I'd write that. So I wrote, uh, I wrote the program that converted their proprietary format to PNG and JPEGs and allowed it to be scriptable. So server admins could automatically upload screenshots of of players and you could see whether or not they were, you know, using wall hacks or aimbots or, you know, things like that. Uh, so it's, I got started in Counter-Strike through through that. 
So have you ever had a, a friend call you and them tell you that you got them banned? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, I, you know, it, it's funny because back in the day when the Counter-Strike.net forums were kind of like the main place, it was always, when, when somebody got caught, it was always, you know, a giant thread about it and, <laughs> and going through and, and just, you know, and then the person would say, hey, you know, that wasn't me or, yeah, it's, I'm sure the same thing happens now where people say, hey, somebody's using my account or, absolutely. or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. That's just crazy to think I'm talking to the guy that helped develop every time you launched Counter-Strike and that little punk buster window yeah. popped up over your screen. Yeah, okay. Um, so let's let's get into the MLG talk. Um, so you were actually a part of GotFrag when MLG bought them out. Did you transition over to, to MLG employment at all or, or did you kind of split ways with them? Um, during the original buyout? You know, it it was kind of disappointing because I would say pretty much everybody got, or I would say nearly everybody got pushed out. Um, uh, you know, the, the plan was, and, you know, when we sold, it was, it was going to be, hey, you know, this is great. Uh, we're just, we just have more funding now or we can do more things. Um, so we're going to keep going with this. Uh, and it's, I, I quickly got the impression that the buyout was more of a, you know, per, purchase us for the assets of the site than um, actually wanting to continue forward and, and develop the system. Um, you know, we, we were actually, you know, going back to uh, GameSense, we were, we were coming out with some incredible things. Um, you know, we were doing... Uh, we, we had a mod, or I, I wrote an Amex mod plugin that was going to allow, instead of just tournaments using GameSense, like your normal pugs, you could record stats and have them individually for your teams. And we were adding uh, XYZ coordinates to the log files so you could have overheads, and like, sh- like you would have a shot chart in basketball. Um, you could see where all the shots and the kills were. And, um, you know, we we were... We had so we had so many things that we were close to completing. We actually had um, we had fantasy leagues coming out, uh, not like the daily fantasy you see now, but just traditional fantasy leagues. Uh, we had all these things coming out, and when we got purchased, it was like great. You know, now we're going to have some additional resources and you know some extra salaries. And it, you know, as soon as we got bought, um, my like my work on that completely stopped. And I, I think for a lot of people, the same thing happened. And it was kind of this limbo where everybody is wondering, all right, what, what happens next? And nothing happened next. It kind of just stopped. It almost makes me upset hearing you talk about that though, with all those things that never were, because those are the things that not only as a, as a fan, as someone who considers himself, trying to do a show that would help out. But just think of like how we were talking about with the advanced statistics. I mean, as a coach of a team, that's everything that you want. You want like almost like how, like a heat map of where shots come from. And so if we're playing fanatic, where on average on the B site, does it just, you know, JW shoot from? And that's something that that would have shown. Oh, absolutely. It's 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 actually pretty interesting to draw parallels now between and it kind of makes me wonder where the negotiations actually happen, the parallels between M- MLG buying Godfrag and then Activision Blizzard now buying MLG because it's a similar situation, it seems like, with it being mostly a purchase for the assets, not so much what was going on, but what has already happened, essentially. Right, and you know, I, I think you can draw some parallels there. Um, I think you know, the situation with, Activision and MLG was a little bit different. Just, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, I was like anybody else in the dark. I had no idea this was happening, but I, I kind of got the impression that it was just kind of bailing them out of debt. And, you know, right. it's it, it, the, the way everything went down and, you know, what's happened to all of our shares now, it, it's kind of, yeah, I, I mean, it's, you know, back when it happened back then, it was disappointing. Um, uh, and when it happened now, it's just kind of, uh, I wouldn't, if anybody's surprised by it, that would probably be a mistake just because it's, I think anybody who's been around long enough could see something like this coming. Um, you know, I, I never, 
after the buyout, when, when we got, you know, half in a buyout or half in cash and half in uh, shares, you know, back in 2007, I genuinely didn't think I would ever see anything from the shares. And if I did, I would just be happy I got something from it. So, uh, you know, I mean, there's still a chance we might get something from it, but it's probably won't be worth the paper it's printed on. You know, it's that's kind of disappointing. But So just one or two more questions, because I don't want to keep you too long, but I definitely appreciate all the insight oh. from here. As a shareholder, I guess from the outsiders, all we have are those articles, and it seemed like the communication from business side to shareholders was just not there. As a shareholder, right. I mean, do you get, have they communicated with you at all, or was the sale really... I mean, yes, you said you, you could see it coming, but was it as a surprise where, hey, by the way, your shares are now... Not yours anymore. <laughs> right. Um... Well, no, I mean, and it, there was a there was actually a good article in uh, Esports Observer that kind of went through the entirety of talking about you know incorporation laws in Delaware and how all this how all this works, um, and you know the the way everything is set up, certain levels of shareholders aren't obligated to you know have a vote or be a part of the meetings or. You know, the only the only thing we're obligated is God Frag, we are Series B common stockholders. The only thing we are obligated is uh a letter of what happened after those decisions were made. So we essentially had no say. Um we weren't you know, by law they they didn't really do anything wrong. We didn't have to be involved in any of that. None of us as a collective contained a majority of the stock. Um, so, you know, I'm the letter, the letter is circulated around by now. Um, you know, we, I got notified in an email, uh, I was as in the dark as anybody else was about it. And, you know, at first I heard, okay, cool. They sold. And I'm thinking maybe I'll finally get something for, uh, the shares, but, you know, you look at what really happened and they basically took MLG as a company and they took. You know, it's it's like if it was a piece of pie and everybody had their hands in it or whatever. And so somebody took the pie and gave it to somebody else and left you with the uh, the pan that was in and said, well, this is what you guys own. I mean, sorry, it's a terrible analogy, but <laughs> essentially they, they essentially they removed all the assets from the company, changed the name of it. So our stock now isn't. Like our, our Series B stock and all the shares we have aren't shares in MLG and they're not shares in whatever Activision Blizzard owns of MLG. Our shares are in this MLG legacy holdings that they changed the company name to. So whatever our stock is worth is the value of that company, which is literally just a company in name that has no assets to it. And after all the liabilities are paid out and, you know, I'm sure that there is a carve out plan of extra money. That's mostly going to go to the, uh, you know, preferred stock members, but I have no idea what the shares are going to be worth. They were estimated, you know, like $27 a share or something, which was just, you know, probably plucked out of thin air. I don't know. Um, but if they're, <laughs> if they're worth one cent a share, I would be surprised at at the end of all of this. Fascinating stuff, how things can turn around to where, yeah. I mean, and it's like you said, from an outsider point of view, you would think MLG is on top in Major League Gaming, but it's crazy how they can buy out one company and then things just, they never really seem to get their feet on the ground after they bought out Got Frag. It just seems like yeah, they bought out Got Frag to get the assets and then just kept never really catching up to themselves. Right. And, it, you know, just having to constantly take out money, you know, they were generating all these assets, which, you know, were tangible things like tournament software and, and you know, ability to run tournaments and, and whatever else. Um, but, you know, from the perspective, if you just watch them over the years, you know, it's hard to see where they ex ever had a plan that would generate revenue. Um, and it seems like they never really did generate revenue is probably mostly just, uh, you know, sponsorship money from the companies that they were running games for, or, you know, advertising and vice versa. Uh, and, it's funny because I feel like with Got Frag and some of the things we were doing, we could have actually got gotten some good revenue generation, something like, you know, an ESEA type system. And, uh, you know, I, I just, 
the way everything went down, I think it was kind of short sighted because the number, the, the talent that Godfrey had and the passion everybody had working there, I, you know, I think they could have done something with it. And uh, I think they were mostly focused on console gaming at the time and, and just wanted the assets. So you know, it's kind of too bad. That's the story of MLG's life. All the talent yeah. and just squandering it away. Well, no one can question what Gottfrag was and has contributed to it. And even then, I mean, Game Sense, I think we can look back when in the future when we finally have something. And I think people will look back at Game Sense and say, you know, that's what kind of stemmed it all. I think you should get back at it, Jason. You need to, you need to uh, kickstart that, that Game Sense stuff again. I need some you know, advanced I, statistics. I might look into it. I've been out of the, I've been out of the game for a while, and I'm um, itching to do some stuff and possibly do some esports stuff. Yeah. So, if just we'll, to we'll make our show research it. easier, yeah, <laughs> that's the only reason you need. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jason, I uh, again, I appreciate you coming on the show so much. Uh, we were fu- huge fans of Got Frag, so when uh, Alchemist gave us your contact information, we knew we couldn't pass it up to have another tail down memory lane. Sure. So, uh, well, yeah, it, was, uh, it was great, uh, you know, appreciate you guys having me on. It was uh, great talking to you guys. No, ab- absolutely. The pleasure was all ours. And if you get back into the scene, let us know. We'd love to, uh, kind of touch base with you and see where we're at. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Not a, not an issue there, sir. Well, uh, Jason, what, what's your Twitter? We always like to pimp that out for our guests. Uh, sure. It's, uh, it's underscore Jason Roman. Real simple. Somebody took Jason Roman, so I put an underscore in front, and uh, there we go. Those so. Twitter squatters, man, I'm telling you, they get me every time. I'm like, oh, I need a new name. Oh, someone's had that account for six years with one tweet. Yeah. <laughs> Good deal. Well, Jason, hey, thanks again then for coming on the show, and we'll we'll keep in touch, okay? All right, thanks for having me. Talk to you guys later.